come three. Sorry? You it's, will be recording, yes. So I just started the recording finally. Fine, record. Right. Everyone's going to miss the fantastic first couple of minutes, but that's okay. I think they can live without. Okay, the important thing is written. So uh, the way I'm going to tell you this story is to start with the easiest part and then get, you know, more and more difficult. So a more and more abstract with the idea that the beginning should be understandable by absolutely everybody. So let me start by reminding you that a nodal curve Oh, and everything will be over an algebraically closed field. And if you want, you can think everything is quasi projective. And uh, when uh, I say curve, I mean variety, so reduced scheme of dimension one. And when I say a point, it will always be a K point. I'm a classical algebraic geometer. So what is a nodal curve? A nodal curve is a curve which a tau locally has the form x, y is equal to zero inside A2. If you don't know what the tau locally means, don't worry. What this means is that Zariski locally, so locally in the usual sense, you can put it inside a smooth surface smooth non-singular surface, and it's still given by the same equation where x and y are local coordinates. So what, why do I care? So let me see, say that I have, a, let's say do the easiest case. I have a curve C with exactly one node. Let me call the node y, and let me call the curve x. And I can normalize it. This is the normalization. And I get a non-singular curve, x bar. And the inverse image of y is now two points, y1 and y2. And I will write y bar as y1 is joint union y2. This is a smooth divisor inside x bar. And if I want to be super fancy, I can say that there is an involution of y bar, which exchanges the two points, and y is the quotient. I mean, it's a very simple case of involution and quotient, but it certainly works. And so my claim now, is that I have a commutative diagram as follows. So this is the quotient map from y bar to y. Remember, this is two points and this is one point. This is the inclusion of y bar inside x bar. It's just the inclusion, the closed embedding, yes? And here I have the inclusion of y inside x. And here I have, again, the normalization map. And of course, this diagram commutes. But I want to argue that it does a bit better than commute. This is what we call a push out or gluing diagram. And uh, what do I mean by push out? It means that to define a morphism from X to anything is the same as defining the morphism here and the morphism here so that they agree. Or in other words, to define a morphism from a nodal curve is equivalent to define a morphism on the normalization such that the two points get mapped to the same. And if you are at all familiar with Gromov-Witten invariants, this property, this push out is uh, basically nobody writes it, but everybody uses it. So it's a very, very useful thing. And if uh, you have seen the definition of fiber product, it's the same thing, but only with all the arrows in the other direction. 
And so what we want to do today is study similar um, singularities, but in higher dimension and slightly more general. So the definition is a surface X is called semi-smooth Now, locally, again, in the same sense, I just explained, it is isomorphic to spec K. Okay. Uh, sorry, U, V, W, modulo, U squared, minus V, W squared. And if you check, you might be familiar, this singularity is sometimes called pinch point, sometimes called the Whitney umbrella, typically when uh, K is the real numbers. This uh, name here comes, uh, I think, from Collar Shepherd Baron, but certainly Collar something. And uh, if we want, we can uh, do the same in higher dimension. So if you know what this means, a variety is called semi-smooth if smooth locally, it's isomorphic to this. Or if you want the tau locally, it's, isomorphism to, it's isomorphic to this times an affine space. So Barbara, uh, 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 intuitive intuition question. So for curves, I think the nodal singularity to me looks, well, it's the simplest thing I can think of. For surfaces, it's not obvious to me that this is the first singularity I should look at. Do you have some explanation or intuition? Well, so the first of all, the true reason for this choice will be revealed at the end. So I will have no spoilers right now. Okay. Let me tell you where I first met these singularities because I actually met them very, very early in my mathematical life. If you take a smooth surface in a high, it, it, let's say, let me start with you take a smooth curve into some projective space and you project it linearly. This is something Italians like to do. You project it linearly to P3. If you do it generically, you get it still smooth and isomorphic to itself. You project it to P2, you get it nodal. You can't get it isomorphic in general. And if you do the same with a surface, you get nodal points, which by the way, as you can see, or you cannot depend how good you are at seeing, but will become evident very soon. Among this, no, um, this uh, the pinch point, a lot of the pinch point is just a curve of nodal points, and then there are some words points, which correspond to the origin there, which are pinch. And then you also get uh, triple points, which are, um, you know, normal crossing divisor, basically, triple points. So in some sense, when the old Italians thought about surfaces, they very often thought about surfaces in P3 with uh, a curve of nodal points and occasionally a pinch point and a, a few and finite number of pinch points and a finite number of triple points. So in this sense, it's very natural. And in another sense, and this is where Collar comes from, there is a whole idea of uh, working with the singularities which are possibly not normal, but are S2, so half of the condition of uh, normality. And in that case, um, there is a kind of semi-normal, semi semi-resolution, and the semi-resolution involves something which is semi-smooth. And That's I, great. Thank you. Okay. Let me go on before I... So, and again, uh, there is a, a theorem or a fact. I mean, we proved it, but I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, this is known, that X is semi-smooth, if and only if, there exists a push-out diagram in the sense before, 
where this is the normalization. X bar is a non singular surface. Oh, and here to say this, I want that the characteristic is different from two. If you like characteristic two, I'm sorry, there won't be any. And uh, Y bar is a non singular divisor. And uh, G is the quotient Y, y bar modulo and involution. And the Y is also non singular. And this turns out to be equivalent to saying that the D bar, which is the fixed locus of the involution, is a smooth divisor, or in fact, if it's a surface finitely many points, reduced in Y bar. And uh, so I will uh, meet. So, some so, so so triple points like x, y, z equals zero, which you also like being, we're both from the Italian school, then, uh, uh, but they're not semi-smooth. They're, they're not, not, not semi-smooth. Oh, and okay. I will not be looking at them and they will not be relevant because I will tell you at the end why. But uh, uh, they, they could be there and I could also write them as push out if I had prepared. If you think I can write push outs like that without preparing, you are mistaken. And let me introduce some notation and we'll meet again. So there are some natural bundles associated to this construction. One bundle is of course the normal bundle of Y bar in X bar. And another line bundle is you have this G is a two to one cover. So if you consider the push forward of O Y bar, this is a sheaf, a rank to uh, locally free, uh, free sheaf on Y, which has an action, an involution. And so it has an invariant and anti-invariant part. And it decomposes into OY, direct sum, an anti-invariant part, which is a line bundle, but which usually you denote by L dual, because uh, uh, D bar, is a section of L to the tensor two. This is the standard way how you do double covers. If you have never seen it, ask Ravi to teach you double covers. It's very bad you have it. So um, it is also very popular. So now you have this. And finally, of course, if you take, you call D, G of D bar, well, this is just isomorphic. To the bar. So what I want to say is that uh, you have um, in the nodal case uh, to get a curve of nodes, so something looking like this, two, uh, slide, two uh, sheets of your surface meeting transversely along a curve, you would be gluing a curve to itself without fixed points. And then when you try to glue it with a fixed point, the fixed point becomes what is called a pinch. And I wish I could draw it, but I cannot. Okay, I will soon be erasing. Is this a good moment? Okay. So this is the dramatis personae. We are these the semi smooth varieties. And uh, before I tell you why we care about them or what this has anything to do with the formation theory, promise it will come. I will start by telling you what we do. What actual, we do some computation and I will tell you what it is. So. What we do. And what we do is the following, let X be semi-smooth. Let me define T1 of X to be X1 of omega X or X. 
So this is a, a notation from the formation theory, but if you want to be super fancy, you can think that uh, singular varieties with uh, what are called the LCI singularities, in particular hypersurface singularities, like, you know, uh, anything given by one equation inside something smooth, they have a natural higher geometry of derived structure in which they are smooth. And this is exactly the higher tangent sheet. So you can be all fancy if you want, or you can just say, this is it. And then let me tell you something. I will tell you later why I care about this sheaf. But for the moment, let me try and find out something about it. Namely, it's uh, easy to show that uh, the singular locus of X has a natural scheme structure such that E1X is an invertible sheaf on X sync. This is a very good exercise. It, uh, if you know enough about uh, you know, how any of this work, you realize that this is an et al local computation. And so you are back to the case of K of U, V, W modulo U squared minus V, W squared inside A3. And so you have a nice, this is our X, and I haven't written the spec. And so I get an exit sequence zero in all A3 of X restricted to X in omega A3 restricted to X in omega X zero. And this too, this is an invertible sheaf because X is a divisor and this is a rank three bundle. And so I apply, you know, the usual magic of hex X and I get the sequence TX A3 restricted to X or A3 minus X restricted to X in T1X in zero because the next step would be the next one here, which is zero because this is locally free. And so this is a line bundle. So if you take a quotient of a line bundle, it is a line bundle on a closed subscheme. And by the way, the same argument works whenever X is a hypersurface inside anything. You just replace the ambient hypersurface here instead of A3. So it's not uh, very, very complicated or very difficult. And so what we do is we compute explicitly in an appropriate sense, and we write it in a moment, but of course I have no memory, so I will have to copy. Maybe, maybe a, a quick question. Um, so the singular, so the singular locus already had the natural scheme structure and then you do the computation. It's not, you don't put some surprising scheme structure on it. No, this is the scheme structure that comes from here. Yeah. So right. completely determined by requiring that it's scheme theoretic support of this coherent sheaf, which then turns out to be invertible over its support. Right. So, you know, in fact, you see, Basically, this map here, if you call F is uh, U squared minus VW squared, this is just a map of the derivatives. And so you, what you can think of this uh, is that this is the Jacobian locus. It's given by asking that not only F is zero, but also all its partial derivatives are zero. And this defines you a scheme structure. And that's the one we have. But uh, in a moment, I'll tell you a bit more. So just let me say what I want to say. So I we will compute T1X and TX in terms of the gluing data. And 
the gluing data are exactly the things that were on this blackboard before. So this push-out diagram and these line bundles. So first of all, X sync has a, a, you know the singular points. This is just Y, which you remember is a non-singular curve. And uh, you see, if you take the derivatives, you get uh, 2U equals zero, which shows why I, you know, don't want characteristic two. And then you get W squared is equal to zero. And then you get 2VW is equal to zero. So this Y in these coordinates, is uh, u is equal to w is equal to zero, but uh, x sing is u is equal to w squared is equal to vw is equal to zero, and so it has an embedded point at the origin. This is uh, basically one of the first examples. I think it's even in Harcher, and I'm pretty sure Ravi put it somewhere in his nice book of what is a scheme with an embedded point. And so what you have is you get an exit sequence where T1x goes to T1x restricted to Y and the kernel is uh, T1x restricted to y tensor with, um, well, it turns out that this is tensor with a normal bundle. Sorry, this is T1x restricted to y, in fact, restricted to d. Remember that we had the d inside y, which was the locus of pinch points, which corresponds to u is equal to v is equal to w is equal to zero and uh, tensor the normal bundle of d in y so if y is a if x is a surface y is a curve d is finitely many points so this is a trivial line bundle and this is also a trivial line bundle so there's nothing to compute but if you are in higher dimension this would be non-trivial line bundles and so what we do is we compute and now I'm sorry, but I cannot remember this by heart, but I can copy it. T1x restricted to y is L tensor, the determinant of the push forward of the dual of the normal bundle of y bar in x bar. Q1. So recall that here G is the double cover, is the gluing map. You start with a non-singular curve in your, uh, in volu in your um, normalization and you glue it to itself. And L was given by G push forward of OY bar is OY direct sum L D1. And we can also compute uh, this normal bundle. And uh, the normal bundle, well, we just write, um, sorry, this is not the normal, but the co-normal. It's the ideal after all. And we write it, and this co-normal, sorry, this is not the, yeah, this is not a normal bundle of T1. This is a, so let, let me just call this A, and then I will tell you what it is. It's, uh, I just uh, don't have enough space to write exactly what it is. This A is R push forward of the normal bundle of Y bar in X bar restricted to D bar. Remember that the D bar is the pinch locus above and that R from uh, D bar to D is an isomorphism because when you take a double cover with a branching then the locus which gets folded over is isomorphic above and below and so we get 
an explicit construction of what these sheaves are in terms of the gluing data, in terms of the normalization. This, of course, is very useful only if for some reason you happen to know the normalization. And indeed, we have an example in mind. And there is something else which we compute. And uh, what we compute is also, not only we compute the T1, but we also compute the tangent sheaf. Recall that this is singular, so the tangent, there is no tangent bundle, but there is a tangent sheaf. And there exists a commutative diagram with set rows. So this is zero to Tx, which is what we want to compute, to the push forward Tx bar, to some sheaf G, which I don't want to say what it is, but just like here, it will be determined in the next line. And this is G push forward of Ty invariant. So recall, G is the double cover. And so if you push forward the tangent bundle, of course, the involution on Y bar induces an involution on the total space of the tangent bundle. And so when you push forward, you get the rank to a rank, uh, double the rank bundle with an invariant and an anti-invariant part, as this is the invariant part. And then this goes to the G push forward of Tx bar restricted to Y bar. Sorry, this is an a Y bar. So you see the tangent bundle of Y bar naturally goes inside the restriction of the tangent bundle of x bar to y bar. And so you can push forward. And then here you just take the invariant part. And the co-kernel is g. And uh, this map is just induced by the restriction. You take tx bar, you restrict it to y, y bar, and then you push everything down. So we get in what this means is we have related the computation of this higher tangent sheaf and the usual tangent sheaf completely in terms of the gluing data which we have used to construct our semi smooth variety. Questions? Everybody dead. Okay. That was good. I got everybody asleep in less than 30 minutes. Um, I have a question actually. Okay. So this higher tangent sheaf, does that make sense? And does it have like the same property that it defines like a scheme structure on the singular locus in general or only for this kind of singularity? So it, it's most natural in the, I, I would say that it defines a natural structure whenever things are LCI. So you can embed them. It, it works exactly like this whenever you have hypersurface singularity, which means it's, at all, it's locally defined by one equation inside something non-singular. And you get something pretty similar if it's a LCI, so locally defined by a regular sequence inside something non-singular. If you don't know what regular sequence means, it means every equation cuts down the dimension exactly by one. And in that case, you actually get this, uh, you know, various structures. You have uh, the locus where the rank is one, the locus where the rank is two, so you get a more scheme structure. But this one is particularly nice. And of course, it has a number of names uh, in the history of singularity theory. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's I, I would call it the Jacobian locus normally because it's really defined by partial derivatives. Thanks. Okay, so, so these are all the results of the paper. And uh, now I would like to tell you something about how we prove it. Of course, I cannot do the proof, but I can tell you what we did. So the first thing to say 
is that uh, the, okay, there are two different parts. There is the T1 and the T. So, how do we compute? And the answer is, we first show that there are maps as in the diagram globally. Globally. And then check exactness locally. The only one which is a bit non trivial is this map here. Because in general, if you have a morphism, you, you don't have a map like this. You have a map above, you have a map like this, but not this one. And so we have to check in this particular case. So we have this one global. We use local coordinates to show that it induces this map. And then everything else, once we have the, the complete picture, we check exactness locally, which basically means we only have to do what I started with, with this one explicit equation of the pinch point. We never have to deal with anything more general than that. And so you just have to sit down and do your computation and be very careful. So this is a kind of very simple, and how about T1x? And here there are two steps. So the first step is if X can be embedded as a globally, as a hypersurface and smooth, non-singular. Then what you get is that the T1x is naturally isomorphic by the same exit sequence we had before to OM of X, which is a line bundle because this is a divisor restricted to X singular. So this makes it very easy to compute. But unfortunately, in general, our semi-smooth variety is not a hypersurface globally. And anyway, even if it were, we wouldn't know how to find such an embedding. So what we do is we construct such an M in case where actually it's not called the M, be patient, it's called B. This is me being bad at letters. In case X is the total space of a line bundle x bar is the total space of a line bundle on y bar. So we start with a simple possible case. Instead of having something complicated, we start just with one curve on one manifold with an involution, and that, then we just take a line bundle. This is the oldest trick known to mankind that if you don't know what you're doing, you try replacing your smooth separate inside something smooth by the normal bundle. If you were doing differential topology, you would call it tubular neighborhood. I learned tubular neighborhoods before varieties, so to me, this is a very appealing and natural thing to do. So, 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 I, I feel, so Bob, I feel, should I be concerned? I mean, the maps you're constructing, I'm wanting to be natural and choice free. And now you're frightening me that they are not. Uh, that you're making choices? Well, no, no, I am starting a special case. I'm not making any choice. I am starting a special case where, you know, X bar is, you know, among, uh, I can do anything, but in particular, I can look at this one. And uh, then I can find it. So the point is, the, the sheet is intrinsically defined, it's just an X one. But if I have a choice for any choice of an embedding, I can use it to calculate it. Because again, recall that I have an exit sequence 
zero OB of X of minus X in omega B restricted to X in omega X. And so when I dualize it to compute X1, I dualize and take the co-kernel. And so the co-kernel is this. I don't know, I hope this sounds convincing, but if it doesn't, I promise you, you just sit down and it will come out right. The point is, this shift here, this is restricted to X, this shift here is not uniquely defined, it depends on the choice of the embedding X inside V, but this shift here does not. And uh, the point is, in this case, in this specific case, you can, uh, you know, just do an explicit calculation and construct this V. In fact, in this case, V is the total space of rank two bundle over Y. And uh, then how do you go? And in this case, you just do all the computations. So in this case, you not only, you know, you just use this and you get everything. It's a very explicit case and you get the result I told you after you understand exactly the construction. And how about the general case? And here we use one of my favorite constructions in the whole length and breadth of algebraic geometry, which is a McPherson degeneration to the normal form. Now, of course, you may know that this is uh, something that comes up in intersection theory, but it basically tells you that whenever you have a regular embedding, for instance, a hypersurface in something non-singular, you can make a one-parameter flat family naturally, where the general fiber, all of them except one, are the original closed embedding, the original regular embedding, and the central fiber is the regular embedding of the, the smaller variety you started with into its normal bundle. So you should view it, you know that in algebraic geometry there isn't a tubular neighborhood, but this is as good, as close as we get to a tubular neighborhood. It's a degeneration. And so what you get is you get a family of uh, surfaces of, of uh, varieties over a one, where over a point non-zero, you get your original X, and over zero, you get the special case where, get the case, where of the total space of the normal bundle of Y bar in X bar. Notice that to pinch, you need Y bar, an X bar inside which it lives, and the involution. So here, this thing here is maybe no longer projective. If you start with a projective X bar, this is a total space of a line bundle, so it will be quasi-projective, but not projective, but it's definitely smooth, and you still have the involution of our Y bar because you haven't touched Y bar. Here, Y bar goes into the total space as the zero section. And what you prove is since you are computing line bundles, you prove that the family of you know, line bundles are parameterized by the Picard variety, and the Picard variety is separated. So you get the map from A1 to a Picard variety, which is a constant away from one point, and then it must also be constant in that point. That's uh, basically the evaluative criterion of separatedness, where you apply it to the case that I like best, so not the spectrum of a discrete valuation ring, but a smooth curve minus one point, and the smooth curve with a point in it. And so what we do is we use this trick to reduce the general computation to this very simple, very explicit special case.
So whenever, you know, that intuitively, this is very satisfactory because what we expect is that in some sense, this is a feature of the singular locus. And so it shouldn't see, you see, you are gluing a surface along itself, uh, on it, with itself, or a manifold, with, uh, smooth variety with itself along a divisor. And so the singularity shouldn't see the rest of the variety. It should only see what happens infinitesimally along this divisor. And uh, the fact that you can do this basically tells you that it really depends only on the first order neighborhood of this divisor inside of Y bar inside X bar. And everything else of X bar doesn't play any role and doesn't influence the in one X. So, so Barbara, in this case, you sh um, you're saying that um, so it's possible there is no such non-singular thing. And this, if there were, you're showing that you get this answer. But really you're yes. saying this is the right answer morally, period. Yes. So okay. of course here, there is something hidden. I told you that I was going from the easier to the more complicated. Namely, I have to prove that for this flat family I get, uh, the various T1s, which are priori outline bundles, fiber-wise, you know, nicely fit together, giving you a global line bundle. And uh, there are probably very nice, easy way to do this, but we couldn't find any. And so, you know, when you want to prove something and you can't do it with the, you know, good manners, you, you know, <laughs> the not so good manners out. And so, you know, how do you say throwing the kitchen sink? With the kitchen sink didn't prove uh, helpful, but the drive categories and cotangent complex sure helped. So I'm pretty sure there are easier ways, but as we couldn't find any, and with this way we found it, you know, it's fine. <laughs> we proved it. So I don't, uh, but uh, you know, there is, it's not a coincidence. I don't tell you exactly how we did the, this part that all these line bundles Glue together, but of course there is a paper and you can look at it. Uh, it's not actually that difficult. It's just that I'm much more at ease making local coordinates computations on varieties than working in derived categories. But um, yeah, basically that's it. So the, the key idea, and again, it's an idea, this idea of uh, degeneration and that using that the limit uh, of a degeneration, the term, you know, tells you that the thing in the center must be equal to the generic one. This is one of the key ideas in Fulton intersection theory. So we are just using the same idea in a slightly different context. Okay, so as my time is coming to a close, it's time to reveal why we did this. And so the first thing I would like to mention is a very nice theorem by Ciolas, Nicolas, Nicolaus Ciolas, 2010, which says that if X is an LCI variety, in particular uh, one which is uh, like ours with hypersurface singularity, it's certainly LCI. And we have such that one, one X is generated by global fractions. Two, H1 of T1 X is zero. H2 of Px is zero, then X has unobstructed deformations. This is very easy, but in fact, it's not due to Ciolas, but we, it's a standard thing. If you know what this means, fine. If not, ignore it. Nothing bad will happen. It just says that the moduli, if there is a moduli space, that moduli space there is non-singular and has a formal smoothing. And 
I will not say what a formal smoothing is. I will instead define which kind of smoothing we will, I will tell you how we use this theorem and what we, I told you this uh, work start, started at MSRI. So let me tell you what actually happened. We were of course having coffee or tea or whatever, you know, in one of the coffee breaks. And as one does in such a case, uh, you know, Rita and Marco, so my co-authors, had recently gotten a referee's report for a paper in which a paper Franchosi Albini Zönke, where they classify stable Korenstein Uh, non-canonical singularities, not only canonical singularities, so worse singularities, surfaces. Bodo surfaces. So if you had been a student in Italy any time in the 20th century, you would know what is a Godot surface. This is a surface of general type. So it's such that if you want, if you take canonical singularities, so ADE singularities, rational double points, it means that the canonical line bundle is ample. And uh, Godot means somehow that the invariants are as small as possible. So Q is equal to zero and k squared is equal to one. And uh, yeah, so there has been a long attempt to, to classify these, uh, these uh, surfaces. And might read long ago, it was proven that the fundamental group can be trivial, z mod two, z mod three, z mod four, and d mod five. And these ones are classified. But of these two, we don't have a classification. We just have some examples, but we don't know whether they are all. And so the idea of this paper was to say, okay, now the moduli of surfaces of general type has a compactification called the Collar, Shepard Baron, and Alexeyev compactification. Collard Shepard Baron came up with the idea, as far as I can tell, and Alexiev proved a fundamental boundedness condition. And in the boundary, there are exactly the stable surfaces. Some are Gorenstein, some are not. But if you want to classify something, maybe you start with the easiest case. And Gorenstein means that the dualizing sheaf is actually a line bundle. So it's a and uh, so they had this nice classification, they sent the paper, and the referee sent, well, you can't even tell us which of these surfaces are smoothable. So which ones are actually on the boundary of the moduli of the surfaces you are, you know, really, really interested with. And, you know, I was there and there was, you know, Rita saying, well, you know, the referee wants, uh, you know, how am I supposed to answer that? In fact, they had a partial answer. In, the, in these three cases, they could use the same argument basically as Miles Street and prove smoothability. But in these two, they didn't. And so, of course, I was there with my big ears and I said, well, you have to remember you have a sister who does the formation theory. And so we started talking about it and there is a Pandeki from Francesi Pardini work progress. So the part we are pretty sure is that among these examples, there is one family, the, one ca the cases they don't know, there is a case which is semi-smooth examples in this classification, and these are all smoothable. And they are smoothable 
by applying Ziola's criterion, because in that case, it's easy to see that formal smoothability implies smoothability, because the canonical she line bundle, the dualizing sheet is ample. And uh, so you see, this criterion is very nice, but in order to apply it, you have to be able to compute these sheaves and to find out whether what their cohomology groups are and whether they're generated by global sections. And so that's exactly what we did. Notice that something which is very traditional and well known is the computation of T1x in the case where the singularity is just a curve or, or a but smooth variety of uh, nodes, because then it's just the tensor product of the two normal bundles. So you have, uh, you know, a family like this, you know, two smooth things meeting transversely along uh, a divisor, and the X1 is the tensor product of the normal bundle in one direction with the normal bundle it's in the other direction. It's well known that the condition that this is trivial is the one that guarantees not just smoothability, but that the total space of a smoothening will also be non-singular. So this is something really well understood for nodal singularities. And what we do is you we push it a little bit more. This part we have essentially done. And then there is another part in which the other case which I will not tell you what it is. It's not semi-smooth, but it's not very different. In this uh, classification, there were two open cases. One is semi-smooth and we fix it. And we are optimistic that the other case is smoothable too. And uh, this seems to be evidence towards something which we all believe, but we don't know how to prove which is that actually all the moduli of uh, Godot surfaces are irreducible for fixed fundamental group, are irreducible and non-singular of the expected dimension. But of course, it's not the proof. It's just a little bit more evidence in this direction. Because to say that, again, what we prove is that these are also non-singular points in the moduli. So this is. Uh, Basically, so in some sense, from a logical viewpoint, this is the beginning of the work. It's the end of the talk, but it's the beginning of the work. This is why we started thinking about doing this computation for uh, semi-smooth surfaces. Uh, but then once we had done the computation, we looked at it and said, well, actually, we never used it as a surface. And so we you know, said, OK, edit it a bit and uh, did the uh, arbitrary. Um, but you know, these are, the, it, these are in some sense comparatively easy singularities which appear when you do moduli of canonical models. So it's not so strange that one is interested in them if you want to compactify. But in any case, we had a specific problem we had in mind and uh, we were happy to be able to solve it. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for listening and ask any questions. Great, thanks. We can all uh, unmute ourselves and, and thank Barbara. Right. Qu uh, questions and comments. Okay, so you, you tell me if I should, can I just sit down briefly? I can go back to the blackboard if uh, need be, but in the meantime, mm -hmm. I can see you. Perfect. So, so why did Cielos prove what? Why, why would Cielos prove that? He, it's like he knew what you were going to want to use it for. Well, you see, it is actually a very nice theorem and a very natural one. In fact, I had tried to prove the same theorem and couldn't. <laughs> I feel very unhappy. But the point is, I had a very uh, how shall I put it? A very naive idea of why it would be how to prove it. And didn't work. <laughs> uh, while uh, the proof by Ziolas is, uh, do you want me to tell you a few words about it? Sure. <laughs> uh, it's very kind of you. I, I, I promise I just take a few minutes, but it's really a very cool idea. 
So you see, if you, the, it, it took me a long time to be comfortable with X groups. But what you get if uh, X has LCI, for instance, hypersurface singularities, you get an exit sequence as follows. Until here, we are talking about the local to global spectral sequence of X, and it's always true. But now there is also one more step because of this extra assumption. This is the same X1. And so if you want, actually, this is H0 of P1X, and this is H1. P1x. And uh, all these spaces have a deformation theory interpretation. These two are tangent and obstruction to deformations of x. And these two are tangent and obstruction to locally trivial deformations of x. And I can give you a formal sense, but basically it means the formations where the singularities don't change. If X is non-singular, locally trivial is the same. Any deformation is locally trivial, and these two are zero. So they have... Uh... And so the feeling is that in some sense, this should measure somehow how the... Uh, it should come as a tangent and obstruction to a factor that measures how the singularities change. So which only this is supported on the singular locus, and so it should be some information about the formations just in the neighborhood of the singular locus. Very tiny. And so what Silas does to prove this is to construct such a deformation factor, which involves the fact that Ziolas no knows um, formal schemes and throws a lot of formal schemes at the problem. While I tried and, <laughs> and it didn't work. So that is, uh, so uh, it is, as I said, it is a very natural question when you see this. It's also in the case when the singularities are isolated. If the singularities are isolated, Notice that the assumption was what? That this was zero, which is always true if the this is supported on the singularities, and that this sheep is generated by global sections, which again is always true for a sheep supported on an affine scheme, and you know everything which is isolated points is affine. And so all of Ziola's condition in case of isolated singularities burns down, turns, uh, it's just H2 of Tx vanishing. And the smooth ability in this case is a nice old theorem. I think I know it from a paper of Burns and Wall, but there might be other people having proven this. So it is a natural generalization of a known theorem for varieties with isolated singularities. And the problem is that with isolated singularities, these two are respectively tangent and obstruction, in fact, there's no obstruction, there's only the tangent, to the deformations of the germ of each singularity at each singular point. But if you take non-isolated singularities, there is no such thing. You cannot define the deformation of the germ, and you are, you know, left out uh, and don't know what to do. So this is, I think, why, it's, I don't know how Tsilas came up with it, I think it comes, I think Ziolas, this was his PhD thesis, and he was a student of Collard, 
And in the paper, he deals uh, both with, with this case and with a special Hugh-Gorenstein case, which is precisely the surfaces or some of the surfaces, I think mostly all the surfaces you get in the boundary of the collage per baron Alexei of compactification. So I suspect that in fact the motivation was very close to our original one. If you have a stable, a surf, a stable surface, which is in the moduli of uh, uh, the compactified moduli, is this on the boundary of the surfaces you really care about, the non-singular ones, or isn't it? And uh, again, if the surface has isolated singularities, we know how to answer this. But for non-isolated singularities, there was not so much. And so this is a really beautiful piece of work. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's... Uh, and uh, for instance, another typical use of this is that on the other hand, if the shift T1x is the zero shift, which can also happen, it doesn't mean for the other kind, not for hypersurface singularities or LCI singularities, but if you have a singularity where T1x is the zero shift, then all the deformations are locally trivial and it cannot be smoothed at all. And this is an even much older result. This is Schlesinger 1968, uh, rigidity of quotient singularities in codimension three and higher. All right, more, more questions or comments? I have one last historical one, which is you, you ascribe deformation of the normal cone to McPherson. Is that right, or that's the? Well, this is what I thought. Uh, it is, in, uh, at least this is what I remember. But it's, in this case, it's actually very simple. It, so the as far as I know, it is MacPherson. But I don't, uh, uh, I just call it like that. It's in the book of Fulton, and uh, it's a Fulton, it's a cornerstone of Fulton MacPherson intersection theory. And it's very general. While in this case, it's in some sense much more classical. Let me remind you how it's done, that if you have, this is something, the general construction is a bit harsh, but if you are at all familiar with smooth variety, you have y, let me call it y bar inside x bar, and these are both non-singular. I think the view needs to be switched. Oh, yes, that's right. We're, we're, watching, we're watching the wall. The view needs to be switched. The camera needs to be switched. Yes. And uh, then what you do is you take x bar to be, to be the blow up of x bar times a1 over y bar times zero. And then you, inside here, there is a copy of the blow up of x bar in y bar which is a closed divisor, and you throw it out. So what you get is you get this family over A1. These are all X bars. And then in the center, you get two components. One is the blow up of Y bar in X bar. And the, what is left when you remove it is the total space of the normal bundle of y bar in x bar. And uh, this works uh, for an inclusion of non-singular variety or more generally if this is a regular embedding, closed regular embedding, you get the total space. It has a normal bundle, you get the total space. If it's not a regular embedding, then you get uh, the famous normal cone. But uh, uh, you can forget about it. You can just uh, do the case where everything is non-singular. If you like to do computations in local coordinates, which as you may realize, I really like to do very, <laughs> especially if they're easy computations in local coordinates, which is even better. And then you can just prove what I just wrote. And you can check that the inclusion, you see the other fibers are all X bar. So they each have a copy of y bar inside. And if you go to the limit, the limit is the zero set. Not only the 
fiber is the normal bundle, but uh, the inclusion extends as the inclusion of the zero section. Very nice. And it, it's amazing that it was not known before, but it, it, it just is a, an amazing, uh, uh, that, that McPherson. You see, as you said, it, uh, it's like uh, half uh, something because without the result yeah. of C plus, it would not be very useful, right? Yeah. I mean, what the, why would people compute it if it, uh, you, know, you don't know what to do with it once you have it? Uh, it's just I don't know why the, the result of CLS seems not to have uh, that many citations, and I don't know why, uh, because I think this would have been one of the first things to compute, so. Great. Okay, so um, uh, maybe now is a good time to officially end, but people can stick around and chat if they'd like, but let's, uh, if you want to unmute again, and thank Barbara once more. And I will stop the recording.